So now we're going to look a little bit about the different applications that droplet microfluidics can be used for. Now there are, there are extremely many uh, ways you can use your droplets. Um, but for here, we're just going to focus on, on these three. Um, first is in diagnostics, then some in biomedicine, how they can be used. And finally, a little bit um, in biology. So let's dive in into the first one. Um, so diagnostics. Well, in diagnostics, most commonly, uh, what the droplet microfluidics are used for is for droplet digi digital quantification. So I'm just going to kind of go through the principle of, of this. So how does it actually work? Well, uh, you have each, each droplet that is either then has something, is full, um, which we call uh, positive, or it's negative, which means uh, you have an empty droplet. And then you score it accordingly. So positive gets number one, negative gets zero. So if you look at, we say all the green ones, let's say they are full. So each one of these gets a number one. And because it's a binary system, then each of the empty ones well, we score it as a zero. So if we look further on, you can do in, in your kind of calculate then the concentration, what you actually have in your sample, because then you can take okay, the what's the total of your positive uh, droplets. So let's say uh, you count it one hundred positive droplets and you divide it by you had your hundred and you had also uh, some empty ones and you also had some empty ones let's say uh, those were also hundred ones so it's a hundred then divided by two hundred so that way you can always find your concentration and if you look at the graph here, so let's say we have, uh, we use fluorescence to find what of the droplets are actually full. We can have the fluorescence signal intensity on the X axis, and then you can have the number of droplets on the Y axis. So on the scale, then you can find, okay, all your empty droplets, they have a very low signal while all your full droplets, they have a very high, very high signal. So you can kind of separate full from empty uh, and that way you can find them. This can be then used for what we call PCR or droplet digital PCR. So I'm just going to first kind of tell you a little bit what is actually a PCR. It's a polymerase chain reaction and it's a uh, method kind of to, to really a really fast way to make millions or like billions of copies of some kind of specific DNA. So DNA is our genetic material. So the goal kind of main goal of PCR is then to to like see if any specific so you only go for specific DNA or RNA is present in, in your sample. And uh, or also to kind of know how great abundance is it very like small amount or is, a, is it a big amount. And this has many applications, uh, for example, for diagnostics of infectious diseases or early stages of leukemia. Um, genetic markers, parental test, uh, I mean, the list goes on, kind of. But then, okay, we have the PCR, but what is then the droplet digital PCR that you use the droplets for? 
uh, while well, you make water in oil emulsions and that way you can partition your DNA molecules. So each droplet then acts as an individual test tube. Um, and this way the PCR is a lot more sensitive and you can also get absolute quantification. So in the schematics over here, you can then say, okay, we have some DNA sample right here. And if we then look closer after we have made droplets, then you have some droplets, then they just contain some kind of background DNA that you don't really, it's, it's always there, but you don't really, you don't care about that. Some droplets are, have nothing at all, but then some actually contain these uh, DNAs that are the, actually what you're looking for. So if we look further on then, well, we know then the generation, it's, uh, it's passive, so it is uh, kind of random. And this is important because this means then uh, it, and uh, the quantification or when you're counting droplets, it's, it's based on what we call Poisson distribution. Um, and this di distribution is, uh, it says that if there's a random distribution of quantifiable independent events, predictions can be made about the likelihood with which these events occur. So we can kind of calculate um, how many of, of these uh, droplets uh, will be empty or have no target and how many then uh, will have target. And there's a specific formula you can, you can uh, then use, which you can use here. Um, and then you can look graph to the, to the right. So you have the you know, uh, P, which is the fraction of positive droplets on the x-axis. And then you can um, kind of use that to, to determine the number of target copies per droplet. And that's, this means also the number of copies uh, of target DNA in your actual sample. So let's say you had 20 microliters of your, of your sample. Uh, so 20 microliters. And you know that, okay, I calculated that the fraction of positive droplets was 0 0.6. Then you can go up here and find your specific number. Aha, I know that there are 20,000 copies of DNA in my sample. And just to kind of illustrate again, uh, our, the point is then when you have your sample droplets, remember that after uh, it's, uh, your droplet um, digital PCR is done, you either have a target, which is one, or you have a zero. So it's always a binary system, uh, which is kind of the key point as I started with, and I will end with this to kind of take away from, from this. And as now we kind of live in a different world um, after COVID, so, uh, I thought could include this because actually droplet digital PCR has become a very big part uh, of kind of detecting um, COVID. Um, so COVID, the virus, um, its genetical material can be both DNA or RNA. Um, and so for that, you actually use what is called a reverse transcriptase PCR. 
um, I won't get go more kind of in detail. You can find a lot on uh, on the different references or, or just uh, on the internet. Um, but the problem with a regular reverse transcriptase PCR is that uh, it has not been very sensitive or specific um, and not uniform when they have tested for COVID. Um, and that is why um, they then turn to droplet digital PCR. And they actually tested that uh, it improved the sensitivity and diagnostic accuracy of COVID um, and is also used whenever you hear in, in, in the news, let's say, or where they talk about, oh, in, in wastewater now uh, shows that uh, there's a downtrend or uptrend of the COVID infection. Well, a lot of times actually for this wastewater, it's return, uh, return In present day, the wastewater is uh, re routinely sampled for COVID-19. So uh, this way you can get a highly uh, reproducible and also a more specific way to detect COVID. But when we move then on to, to medicine, um, droplet microfluidics are very much uh, now used as uh, and drug carriers, or there's uh, shell partic core shell particles is uh, what we then call them. Um, so the definition of core shell particles, it's uh, that it's a category of uh, particles that consist of two or more distinct layers of some material. And as implies by the name, this is usually core uh, and a shell. So what kind of applications does this have? Well, it can be drug delivery, it can be some kind of biomedical science, tumor therapy, the list kind of goes on. Um, and why is it then? Why are these core shell particles uh, kind of so good or what is the purpose of them? Well, they are very good at maintain, uh, maintaining the active compounds uh, stable. So what is in them can be very, very stable. And let's say with drugs, you can then, if you put them inside, you can actually deliver the medicine in the place in the body where it needs to be. Um, so usually if you kind of just take a pill it will start dissolving, uh, but here you can actually control and uh, say have it stable until it reaches the destination. Um, and that also means that is uh, you can also choose to let's say have a constant release rate. So where it is, it can slowly what is inside can slowly be released. And also the main thing is. Uh, like with, with drugs, for example, that uh, it only, um, it's kind of only releases with the causative agent and it means only affects the causative agent and it doesn't damage kind of the rest of the body. Uh, let's say with, um, let's say you have a chemotherapy where it's the whole body that uh, gets kind of uh, damaged and not just uh, the, the kind of causative agent, the cancer part. So this way you can kind of uh, make it a, lit, a, um, a bit more um, kind of uh, easy for the, for the patient and not so damaging. So what is the actual microfluidic technology kinda for this? Well, they produce highly stable and uniform monodispersed particles uh, with high encapsulation eff uh, efficiency. And this you can also improve the drug encapsulation um, and you can put then more than just one drug uh, in the same carrier, uh, kind of dual function 
and just have a lot more flexibility when you use microfluidics uh, for this. And I can show you um, the next part. So kind of the fabrication or how you generate. Well, you can do it in single step. And we have some examples uh, with single step, how to do it. Uh, we have seen already oil and water. You can have many different, uh, different kind of designs, way to encapsulate. But main thing, as you see, for example, here, core, uh, core and, and shell outside. Um, you have also, you can have a little bit more complicated where you have several things. So we were talking about, let's say, different drugs, and then they're all encapsulated in, in here, in these nice uniform droplets. Or you can have different kind of liquids, can kind of double immersion. There's a lot, uh, a lot of ways you can do it. And you can find more, uh, a lot more information as well, if you want to look at this uh, review. Um, but yeah, the most important part, if you look at it, is basically that uh, two liquids, uh, either partial are partially miscible or, or immiscible, and actually also quite important is that it's not not only liquid emulsions, you can also make gas in water, in oil, or many different uh, different combinations. Um, so a lot of options here. But now let's look at the final part. So that is in, in biology. In biology there are many different applications as well. Um, but I'm going to show an example about study model organism. So what is a study model organism? Well, it's a non-human species that is extensively studied to understand particular biological phenom uh, phenomena. And from that you expect that uh, you can discover something uh, in the model organism that will kind of give further insight uh, to how other things work in, let's say, for example, other, other species. Um, and you have here kind of the different, what is usually used as, as model species, uh, and it can be for different purposes. Uh, for, for example, mouse, um, which is used a lot in, in cancer studies, a lot of experiments are used for, for that. Um, but today we have the roundworm. So the one uh, roundworm or Cenorabdis ele elegans, uh, it's used for understanding uh, genetic control of de development and physiology, and also especially about uh, things about the neuronal uh, pathway. So a lot of like brain studies, but also kind of early stages of development um, is a lot of that research is done. So let's sort of take a further look of the example. So it was a nice study uh, in 2015. And they wanted to study the, the worm and do experiments. Um, so they, what they actually made is hydrogel droplet uh, kind of platform uh, for high resolution imaging and then also sorting of these early larval uh, stages of the worm. So they did imaging in both bright field and fluorescence. This means that they could image the worm and they could also track fluorescence genetic markers inside the worm. And they could also, based on what they wanted, they could then further on sort the different uh, the worms on different kind of uh, morphological phenotypes. 
But over here, I'm just going to go quickly through the actual kind of platform that they have. So the main thing is that they use this special hydrogel. Um, and it's special because um, it's, if you look at here, um, it's in a, a kind of gel state. Um, but up here, it's in the water state. So when they encapsulate, uh, the droplet uh, is, is, or the solution is in its water stage. So you have actually the, the solution with the worm coming. Um, and then you have the carrier fluid and you encapsulate your worms. And to make sure that there is uh, always space between your worms. They also have this special uh, spacer fluid. So you get um, like the actual worm and then you get a little bit of space and then worm again to kind of keep them separated. Um, and they actually then can use temperature to make sure that when they store their drop, uh, their uh, worms, they actually immob immobilize the worm. So the, the fluid turns into gel. And this means that the worm cannot squirm around. And this is when they actually do their imaging and they can look at the worm and it's standing still, you could say. Uh, it's very nice. Uh, and then again, as they change temperature, then it becomes again this liquid form and the droplet, uh, the worm can can move around in this droplet freely. Uh, but uh, when they have during imaging, they acquire some information and they can that use that further on when they want to sort. Okay, these worms have something important we want to look at further. We will keep those, sort those here while here okay these were didn't have anything we wanted so they can kind of throw them away so it's a very nice kind of illustrates platform uh, you can use droplets to to study uh, actual uh, different species um, of organisms so what did we go through to applications well, we looked at diagnostics. We had this uh, binary system of positive or negative droplet, one and zero, which is used for the droplet digger PCR um, and has become very important in, in our COVID uh, times now. Um, we looked at biomedicine, the kind of mainly drug delivery, uh, what, how the core shell particles that uh, can be used to, for that. And then finally, we looked at some biology and uh, this was the kind of the roundworm where we had them in these hydrogel droplets that enabled them to move and you could actually uh, look at them and study. All right, uh, that is it. Thank you for listening. Thank <music> you.